Okay, guys, a few minutes in. Just checking the audio. Got my coffee. Sorry, I didn't know I was uh, hitting a DFA live stream. I'm not that organized. I just thought I'd do this tonight to listen to the governor's speech. Harmony's asking how I drink coffee so late. Probably because of the architecture study I did. The architecture study. Let's see if I can... How's that? Ah, oh, that's getting rid of the time. We've got a minute to go. Okay, everyone. Hello. We have the stream here. And welcome. Oops. Someone's just done something. Welcome a new subscriber. Thanks for joining during the stream. Okay, so I'm just Is that text still a bit hard to read? Isn't it? Oh, we'll all be good. We will all be good. We'll come over here. Okay, so you can all, everyone can hear me. The audio is good. Welcome. I'm streaming on Twitch and on YouTube. And you can see we've got nine viewers on YouTube and two on Twitch. Thank you to everyone who's joining us tonight. I thought I would just organize this, well, throw it together really, to listen to our Reserve Bank Governor's speech that he gave today. So I've got my coffee here. And thanks all for joining me tonight. Let's have a look. And sorry that I've I'm seem to be hitting the same premiere time. Good day from Twitch Pub Test, the same uh, live stream time as Walk the World. Martin North's channel. I didn't plan it. I probably should get a bit more organised since there's definitely some overlap in viewers. So thanks all for joining. You can hear my audio. I'm getting. Zero bitrate errors from things appearing everywhere. I'll just turn it on. Okay, good. That's working. 
Okay, so guys, I thought we would listen to this speech from the Reserve Bank Governor. I saw, at the moment, I'm busy drafting over a deadline at the end of the month. So, you know, I'll, I'll do a few videos in the morning and then things will appear throughout the day. And like the whole oil going crazy, I completely, <laughs> I completely missed until, boom, it just, it just crashed. And uh, this one, I was, um, this one, I just saw an article today. I thought, oh, that might be interesting to talk about tomorrow, about apparently we're worse than the Great Depression. So let's have a look. Uh, you want a hyzer for PM? That I'd be terrible PM, guys. The power would completely go to my head. You got to remember my, my heritage. You know, yeah, no, nah, it'd be terrible. I don't, I don't know if I could uh, pull off the Marcus Aurelius style leadership. I think it, it, it'd degrade into a dictatorship real quick. You know, arrogant bald men. You know, who think they know everything better? Bloody hell. Pub test wants to get into the airline business. Definitely. It's. It's funny, guys. It's just crazy what's going on, isn't it? How are you all going anyway? Is everyone keeping... Before we get into this, is everyone going okay with the lockdown? How's your family? No one else has caught the virus? <laughs> Chris Show is paying well. Good luck with that, mate. It'll You often pay more, more in the long run. Well, let's have a listen to this, guys. So I will just overlay, overlay this, and let me know how the audio is going. Yeah, no one's a fan of the lockdown. It does seem a bit. The problem is, we're never going to know if either they were really smart in locking down the economy and avoiding issues, or if um, if they overreacted. It's going to look exactly the same. Ryan's saying he might work from home forever yeah and that's gonna that's gonna happen that is gonna happen i guarantee you a lot of people will just find a way to work home from forever for to be more adaptive you know it's gonna be it's gonna save a lot of money it's definitely gonna save a lot of money so taiwan is they're, they're much more prepared at this than we are they're much more prepared Okay, so let's have a listen to our Good governor's speech. And thank you for joining us on this conference call. When I spoke a few weeks ago, I talked about the importance of building a bridge to the recovery and helping as many people and many businesses as possible get across. Nope, let's that not bridge. have a listen to our governor's speech. Over the past month, the How scale of. How do I pause that? One second. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. I'm going to be right back in a sec, guys. I've got to get my earphones. <laughs> Okay. It's interesting, how many of your post was just pinned by YouTube? I wonder why. Nothing in it seemed too inappropriate. Why do you think this would be this would be pinned by YouTube, guys? It's not really offensive, there's no swearing there. Probably because the word Chinese could be seen as a racial term. That's probably why. And you had the word out there. That'd be why it picked it up. That'd be why. Okay. Bear with me for a sec, guys. I just got to get this sorted. Otherwise, I get audio feedback whenever I listen to anything with you all together. Hey, pub. Looks like I'm getting people on... Dodgy bots on Twitch. Okay. That should, that should be working. That national bridge building task has grown in size. As our efforts to contain the virus have had to be stepped up, 
that bridge has had to be bigger, longer and stronger. As a country, we've been up to the task. It's clear... Okay, I'm going to restart this, guys, because I've only just got... It's a spam bot bandit, okay. Uh, I don't know how to do that, mate. i got to make you a, an admin on this thing. Um, block. There we go, done. Okay, here we go. We're a bloody polished operation here, guys. <laughs> so let's have a listen to this one now that I can actually hear it. And we'll see how our governor is going. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us on this conference call. When I spoke a few weeks ago, I talked about the importance of building a bridge to the recovery and helping as many people and many businesses as possible get across that bridge. Over the past month, the scale of that national bridge building task has grown in size. As our efforts to contain the virus have had to be stepped up, that bridge has had to be bigger, longer and stronger. As a country, we've been up to the task. It's clear, though, that we will face some difficult days ahead. But Australians should take reassurance from the fact that all arms of public policy are pulling together. We're all working to make sure that the Australian economy will get through this difficult period and that we'll be well placed for the recovery on the other side. So by Mr. Nice Guy saying more cliches, I'm assuming you're all hearing the audio fine. Harmony loves his voice. It's not the type that would put you to sleep, would it? Not intentionally. Today I'd like to provide an update on the Reserve Bank's economic outlook and also an update on the implementation of the Reserve Bank's policy package announced a month ago. I'm going to start off with the economic outlook. As you would know, economic forecasting is difficult at the best of times. It's even harder at times like this than when we're experiencing a once-in-a-lifetime event. Given this, I don't think it makes sense at the moment to focus on forecasts to the nearest decimal point, as we're often prone to do. Instead, I'd like... I'll, I'll just have to... I, I have to bring up this chart when he said that. Guys, sorry, I can't help it. I just have to do it. <laughs> is that petty of me, guys? Is it? Is it petty of me? Yeah, probably is. Probably is. ...to focus on two broad issues. The first is the immediate outlook for the economy, and the second is the speed and nature of the economic recovery. In terms of the immediate outlook, the next few months are going to be very difficult ones for the Australian economy. One very obvious consequence of the efforts that are needed to contain the virus is that many normal activities can't, can't take place at the moment. This means that for as long as these uh, the various restrictions are in place, we don't have the jobs and we don't have the incomes that come from these normal activities. And on top of this, at the moment, there is a higher level of uncertainty about the future, which means that many households and businesses are holding back. I heard that too, Damien. Back on their spending and investment. So the result of both the restrictions and this uncertainty is that over the first half of 2020, we are likely to experience the biggest contraction in national output and national income that we've witnessed since the 1930s. Did we all hear that, guys? I can't imagine it's going to be surprising to anyone here. But... Bloody hell. Putting precise numbers on the magnitude of this contraction is difficult. <laughs> Lowe is so clever he can state the obvious. Yes, but it's the way you, you say it. The way, there's an art. But our current thinking is along the following lines. National output is likely to fall by around 10% over the first half of 2020, with most of this decline occurring in the June quarter. Total hours work in Australia are likely to decline by around 20% over the first half of the year, which is a staggeringly large number. The unemployment rate is likely to be around 10% by June, although well, I'm hopeful that it might be lower than this if businesses are able to retain their employees on lower hours. He's hoping that people will be retained on lower hours. 
the unemployment rate would have certainly been much higher than this without the government's JobKeeper program. But that's not work. <laughs> that's not work. Oh, I, I guess, I mean, the yes to spin a narrative. These are all very large numbers and ones that were inconceivable just a month or two ago. And they speak to the immense challenge that our society faces in containing the virus. In terms of inflation, we're also expecting a significant decline in the June quarter. The large fall in oil prices combined with the introduction of free childcare and the deferral or reduction in some price increases means that it's quite likely that year-ended headline inflation will turn negative in the June quarter. If so, this would be the first time since the early 1960s where the price level has fallen over a full year. In underlying terms, though, we expect inflation to remain positive. As the economic data roll in over the coming months, they will present a very sobering picture of the state of our economy. There will be many reports of record declines in economic statistics. As Australians digest this economic news, I would ask that we keep in mind that this period will pass and that a bridge has been built to get us to the other side. With the help of that bridge, we will recover and the economy will once again grow strongly. A bridge has been built? What's, what's it based on? I mean, seriously guys, what's going on here? Oh, is my stream... I'm stuck for a little bit, okay. I guess, a bridge? Is the job keeper the bridge? Is that keeping the relationships between business and employees? That bridge has been partly built with the help of Australia's strong balance sheets. In particular, the strong balance sheets of our governments, our private banks, and of the Reserve Bank. Australia's long record of responsible fiscal policy has allowed governments... Yeah, a straw bridge. <laughs> yeah, a straw bridge. Winston's reckoning bamboo. Bamboo ain't too bad unless it bows. Had some flooring we put in a, in a house. To use and their balance sheets to help smooth out the income shock and to offer protection to those most affected. In doing so, our governments are making a major difference. The strong balance sheets of our banks are also helping. By offering repayment deferrals, our banks are rightly acting as shock absorbers and helping the economy get through this difficult period. Banks are the good guys, everyone. That's what it is. Banks are the good guys. <laughs> of course. Of course. Lucky we have the banks. You know, lucky they're here to take care of us and to act as shock absorbers, you know. And as I'll speak about in a few minutes, the Reserve Bank itself is using our balance sheet to help keep funding costs low and credit available to both businesses and households. Without these strong balance sheets, we would have been in a much more difficult position. I would now like to turn to the speed and nature of the recovery. I think we can be confident that our economy will bounce back and that we will see it recover. We need to remember that once the virus is satisfactorily contained, all those factors that have made Australia such a successful and such a prosperous country will still be there. Inevitably, the timing and pace of the recovery depends upon how long we need to restrict economic activities, which in turn depends on how long it takes to effectively contain the virus. So it's difficult to be precise, and I think at the moment it makes sense to think in terms of scenarios, and consistent with this, the Reserve Bank will discuss some possible scenarios in the Statement of Monetary Policy, which we'll release in a few weeks' time. But one plausible scenario is that the various restrictions begin to be progressively lessened by, by around the middle of the year, and are mostly removed by late in the year perhaps with the exception of the restrictions on international travel. Under this... We'll have to see. Thanks for the... Thanks for the super chat, Nico. Appreciate it, mate. Here's a... Um, here's a question that a lot of people... Well, what about secondary outbreaks in China? How long? That, that's the thing. If it returns... If it returns, what's going to happen, guys? You know? 
people will just go will go nuts. The confidence is going to get hammered. What's going to happen to the economy, everyone? Oh, we'll keep going. We'll keep going. Scenario: We'd expect the economy to begin its bounce back in the September quarter, and for that bounce back to strengthen from there. If this is how things play out, the economy could be expected to grow very strongly next year, with GDP growth of perhaps six or seven percent. Did you all hear that? Did, did, did anyone else hear that, guys? The economy growing very strongly next year with GDP growth of six percent, six or seven. Did, did we hear that? Did I just imagine that? Maybe I need to have more coffee. <laughs> How we've got under, you know, Pub was saying on on the Twitch we've got already got an underemployment. How, how? Yeah, six no, percent laugh. I need a drink. Harmony's laughing. You know, Quinty Q09 needs a drink. Richard, six percent. Um. Is he talking about? Including all the MMT money printing <laughs> or six percent in bond purchases. What 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 is happening here? After a fall of around six percent this year. Ooh. Snuck that in there. He's thinking a fall for six percent. What's the rationale for that prediction? Well remember, a six percent fall, you need much more than a six percent climb to come back up again. There is though quite a lot of uncertainty around these numbers with the exact profile of the recovery depending not only when the restrictions are lifted, but also on the resolution of the uncertainty that many people feel about the future. I think it's harder still to make forecasts about the unemployment Toilet rate, paper, money printing. given the uncertainty about how many employees will remain attached to their firm and whether people who are stood down will be looking for employment and thus counted as unemployed. But it is likely that the unemployment rate will remain above 6% over the next couple of years. Six percent over the next couple of years at unemployment rate. Remember, this is based on the ABS data, guys. This is not on the Roy, Roy Morgan data. And then the underemployment rate's going to be even worse. It's all over the place, isn't it? Six percent uh, is his growth that he's predicting for Australia next year, the decline of Australia this year, and the unemployment rate for the foreseeable years. And with many firms delaying or cancelling wage increases, year-ended wage growth is expected to decline to below 2% before gradually picking up. And in underlying terms, inflation is expected to remain below 2% over the next couple of years and to reach 1% later this year. Of course, there are other scenarios as well. On the optimistic side, the restrictions could be lifted more quickly with the virus being contained. In that case, a stronger recovery could be expected, particularly in light of the very strong monetary and fiscal stimulus that's been put in place. On the other hand, though, if the restrictions stay in place longer, or they have to be reimposed, the recovery will be delayed and it will be interrupted. In that case, the loss of incomes and jobs could be even more pronounced than the scenario that I've outlined today. But whatever the timing of the recovery, when it does come, we should not be expecting that we will return quickly to business as usual. Rather, the twin health and economic emergencies that we're experiencing right now will cast a shadow over our economy for some time to come. It's highly probable that the severe shocks we're now experiencing will change the mindsets of some people and of some businesses. I agree with that. I think he's right on, right on the ball with that prediction. 100%. And what's this people are talking about a 25% GST and a 15% GST? Stop complaining, everyone. You need that. It's to take the heat off the economy so they can print as much money as they want. You know? Just just do as you're told, everyone. Do as you're told. <laughs> this the nice guy reckons it's all from CoreLogic. You think they're working together. Maybe. But th there are definitely going to be changes. I hope people wake up. I really do. Even when the restrictions are lifted, it's probable that some of the precautionary behaviour that we're seeing at the moment will persist. And in the months ahead, we are likely to lose some businesses despite best efforts, 
and some of those businesses will not reopen. There will also be a higher level of debt and many households might reevaluate the risks of having highly leveraged balance sheets. It's also probable that there will be structural changes in the economy. We're all learning to work, shop, shop and travel differently at the moment and some of these changes will probably stay with us for some time, requiring a rethinking of business models. All this means that the crisis will have reverberations right through the economy for some time to come. The best way of dealing with these reverberations is to reinvigorate the country's growth and productivity agenda. As we look forward to the recovery, there is an opportunity to build on the cooperative spirit that is now serving us so well, to push forward with reforms that would move us out of the shadows that are going to be cast by the crisis. Reforms. What reforms do you think they're going to talk about? Do you think they're going to be gutsy and bald? Do you think they're going to look at ways of reducing legislation, reducing the burden on the average people, allowing small business to thrive? <laughs> no, I doubt it. It's going to be more of the same. We'll get that cash ban in twice as fast. You know, MMT will be deployed. Everyone will get a million dollars a day forever. And then we'll just tax you to death. A strong focus on making Australia a great place for businesses to... Make Australia... He almost said make Australia great again. He's a trumper. Who would have thought? We expand, invest, innovate and hire people is the best way of extending the recovery into a new period of strong and sustainable growth and rising living standards for all Australians. And I hope we're up to that task as well. I would now like to change tack and turn to the Reserve Bank's policy response. To recap, that response has had five elements. First, a reduction in the cash rate to 25 basis points with forward guidance that the cash rate will not be increased until we are making sustainable progress towards our goals of full employment and inflation. Second, the introduction of a target for the yield on three-year government bonds of 25 basis points and a preparedness to buy government bonds in whatever quantities are needed to achieve that target. The third element of the package was the introduction of a term funding facility under which authorised deposit-taking institutions have access to funding from the Reserve Bank for three years at 25 basis points with additional funding available to ADIs if they increase their lending to businesses, especially to small and medium-sized businesses. Does anyone know a small or medium-sized business person now that is borrowing money? Does anyone know? Because I, I can't tell. I, I, I talk to my friends, no one knows. No one knows, does anyone know? So none of us is asking if this is live. I'm live, and we're all live, but the governor isn't. No, the governor ha gave his speech earlier today, so I pre-recorded it. But we're getting to chat live. So, who would borrow? I mean, the interest interest rates are nothing. But what would you borrow for your business? Would you? Would you? You'd have to be pretty ballsy to do it. Maybe if your business is one of those that are uh, directly benefiting from this crisis. Yeah. it's... I don't know. Maybe, maybe I've been watching too much Dave Ramsey. That's what it is. <laughs> I've been binge watching him while I've been drafting. That's why it is. Why borrowing just seems evil to me now. <laughs> but I guess it's zero point two five percent. There's plenty of places. If we could get that money for zero point two five percent, just go to a bank overseas, park it in there, and rake the money. No, it doesn't quite work like that, does it? The fourth element of the package is to use our daily open market operations to make sure that there is plentiful liquidity in the Australian financial system and to use our bond purchases to promote the smooth functioning of the market for government securities. The fifth and final element was the modification of the interest rate corridor system so that balances held in exchange settlement accounts at the Reserve Bank earn 10 basis points rather than zero. This represented a very comprehensive package and it's an important part of that national effort to build the bridge to the recovery that I spoke about earlier. It was designed... This is his bridge. This is his bridge. <laughs> okay. Mr. Nice Guy, if your business is worth negative 1.5 billion, does that make you a small business? 
No, that makes you a shit business. So this is his bridge, all these... But then again, this is their whole... whole their, I, I suspect they actually believe they're doing the right thing. That's what scares me so much. To help keep funding costs low right across the economy and to make sure that credit was available to businesses and to households. What, what's wrong with copying something that everyone else has done? Damien. <laughs> He's less optimistic than foreign. Oh, come on. I'm not that pessimistic. I've got rid of this, the, the wide score now. I'm young and happy and, and stupid and, and, you know. Housing always goes up, guys. Quick. Borrow. Now. Buy houses. Following the announcement of this package, the yield on three-year government bonds has declined and it's now at the target level of 25 basis points after having been around 50 basis points immediately prior to our announcement. Liquidity in the Australian government bond markets also improved substantially and this important market is working much better now. Bid our spreads are a little wider than they were a couple of months ago, but they have narrowed substantially just recently. To date, the Reserve Bank has bought around 47 billion of government bonds. We bought bonds along the yield curve and bonds issued by the Australian government and by the... 47 billion in government bonds, guys. Just think about that. ...through daily auctions in the secondary market. The initial purchases were quite large, four and five billion dollars a day. In those first days, we were keen to underline our commitment to the target and we were seeking to relieve some of the severe dislocation that was apparent in government bond markets at the time. As conditions in the market have improved, the three-year yield has settled around 25 basis points and we've scaled back our daily bond purchases. Over recent days, the purchases have averaged around $750 million. Thanks for the super chat, debt and regret. regret? We have gold because we cannot trust governments. Yeah. I, that's why you don't want the... That's why you don't want the government to print their own money. God bother a one. This may seem terrible how they're doing it, but at least there is a slight... Slight buffer between the two bodies. Because it could get a lot worse. We are prepared to scale up these purchases again, though, if needed. And we will buy bonds in whatever quantity is needed for us to achieve our target. Oh well, there you go. That's what they said they'll do. Great. Every time they do it, we lose our purchasing power. With conditions more settled at the moment, our plan for the immediate future is to schedule any bond auctions we conduct for three days a week, Mondays, Wednesdays and Thursdays. That does not mean that we will necessarily purchase bonds on each of those days. Whether or not we do so will depend upon the yield on three-year government bonds and on how the market's functioning. It's likely, though, that for, that for the foreseeable future, we'll be purchasing semi-government securities weekly. And as is the case at the moment, we'll announce, it, announce our intentions at 11.15 each day. And if conditions warrant it, we will return to daily bond purchases. There you go. So... They'll be announcing it, and hopefully they'll expect to get a hit or a result from it. So people will rush in to buy some bonds before. You reckon you could play it, guys? Could you play the bond market? Maybe with CFDs? Try and make a bit of money every week? I'd like to restate that we are buying bonds in the secondary market. And we are not buying bonds directly from the government. That makes all the difference. I need a money printer goes... <laughs> Brr emoji. <laughs> okay, I'll have a look. I'll have a look. Problem is I've got no time to do anything like that until the end of the month. I've got a deadline, so I'm just... When I'm not, you know... The videos that I do, it's me having a coffee break and getting away from drafting. So I'm sitting there uh, drafting wall details. So I need a break. And One of the underlying products. principles of Australia's institutional arrangements is the separation of monetary and fiscal policy. That is, the central bank does not finance the government. Instead, the government finances itself in the market. How convenient. 
How convenient. Do all the citizens, do we get, we should, uh, you know, own the central bank. It, it doesn't need to be part of the government. We should get payments from all of these bonds that they're buying. You know, all the payments should go to us. This principle has served the... Oh. <laughs> Thanks for the super chat, pub. $15 minus 6%, is that it? <laughs> Thanks. Country well. And I'm confident the Australian, federal, state and territory governments will continue to be able to finance themselves in the market as they should. While we're not directly financing the government, our bond purchases are affecting the market price that the government pays to raise debt. Our policies are also affecting the price that the private sector pays to And just to think, they, they get the money from nowhere and they get to manipulate the economy. Do you, do you think they're, they're... I mean, it would have to be a conflict, conflict of interest. These guys know what they're going to do, so can they play the market on private? I guess that's why you've got to pay them you know, a million bucks a year so they don't get tempted. Raise debt. In this way, our actions are affecting funding costs right across the economy as they should be in the exceptional circumstances that we now face. But our actions should not be confused with the Reserve Bank financing the government. Another okay, guys, so we're getting confused that the Reserve Bank is financing the government, just that the government is issuing bonds and the Reserve Bank just happens to be buying them and happens to let us all know that they plan to buy them until they reach a certain rate. Yeah, they're not funding the government, guys. We're getting confused. Another element of the recent package was the term funding facility. Around $3 billion of the initial allowance of $90 billion has already been drawn under this facility with around 35 institutions participating so far. The knowledge that ADIs have access to this scheme over coming months has reduced any concerns that there might have been about possible liquidity strains in the future. In doing so, this scheme has supported confidence that Australia's ADIs will be able to access the liquidity that's needed to support their customers. It's also contributed to the low cost of borrowing new funds at fixed interest rates for both businesses and households. The drawings under this facility combined with the bond purchases and the Reserve Bank's open market operations have resulted in the balances held in exchange settlement accounts increasing very substantially. At the beginning of March, these balances stood at around $2.5 billion. Today, they stand at $83 billion. And on the other side of the Reserve Bank's balance sheet, there are increased holdings of government bonds purchased both outright and under a purchase agreements in our daily overmarket operations. This very large increases in the balances held in exchange settlement accounts has affected the operation of our cash market. The number of transactions in this market has declined as fewer institutions need to borrow settlement balances each day. The cash rate has also drifted below 25 basis points and today is at 15 basis points. Both of these changes are consistent with experience in other countries and they've not come as a surprise to us. The increase in liquidity in the financial system has also resulted in the spread between the bank bill spot, spot, swap rate, BBSW, and the overnight indexed swap rate, the OIS rate. Ray, the problem with that is that there's, you know, there's no real money only currency and asking people to understand the difference is people's financial literacy is so low thanks to our education system. They seem to think the government having debt isn't their burden so you're a step a step further down the rabbit hole i think than a lot of people falling significantly at the three month horizon the bbswois spread is now down around zero which is the lowest it's been in years and this has further reduced funding costs for both the banking system and for the non-bank lenders the increased liquidity in the system has also meant that the reserve banks are Daily open market operations are now on a smaller scale and we've adjusted the frequency of our longer term operations. And we will continue to adjust these operations as required to support the liquidity of the Australian financial system. So that is where we are four weeks after the announcement of our policy package. This package, combined with the government's fiscal policies, 
and the work of the banks and many businesses is building that strong bridge that I've spoken about. Our monetary response is keeping funding costs low right across the country and it's keeping credit available to businesses and households. The fiscal response is providing significant support to both jobs and incomes. Businesses are also helping their employees by keeping them on wherever they can and the banks are supporting their customers with more flexible terms. Supporting their customers with more flexible terms so you can be indebted to them for even longer. Well, it's good to see there's a roll call of people who are out of debt. We should do a debt scream here. Um, what was it? Like uh, like my, my current obsession with <laughs> Ramsey stuff. I mean, that, I mean, Afterpay is growing during this, guys. People are using Afterpay like crazy. Greg's asking, why do we pay tax? Well, that's an interesting question, Greg. You know, if you look at the MMT school, it's so they can manage the economy and manage us. Debt and Regret wants me to do a poll. Uh, hmm. I don't know how. <laughs> I don't know how. Um, I'll figure it out, mate. I'll do it. We'll do a special special episode on it. Maybe some some good news. Together. Uh, don't, don't get me wrong. I, I understand Afterpay has some benefits. But it just shows you, you know, if you go on Afterpay, it means you don't have cash. I'd rather people do Afterpay than they hit... Um, Hit the credit cards. These efforts are helping the Australian economy through a difficult period and they're positioning us well for the recovery. On that note, thank you very much for listening. And I'm very happy to answer some questions. No, thank I'm live streaming. Oh, before he's going to answer questions, everyone here is Edward. He's asleep. He's asleep. Can you see him? <laughs> Good night. Good night, honey. Good night, Eddie. Newborns. So, there we go, guys. Enthralling speech, hey? <laughs> Enthralling speech. Thanks for the congrats on the bud, bub. Um, he's doing okay. So, let's have a look, guys. What do you reckon? We will now go to questions. Oh, well, they're going to questions now. Are we all ready? Please limit yourself to one question each. If you wish to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. You know what we should do? We should get John Adams to get in on this call and ask his questions to the governor that'd be entertaining getting getting johnny on there <laughs> that'd be good if you wish to cancel your request please press star two if you are on a speakerphone please pick up the handset to ask your question pub's asking how we get on these calls i don't know probably ring up the reserve bank and find out i've gotten on calls for announcements from big companies and hardly any people they're just a few reporters you know Sashwin is asking how many softballs are going to be there <laughs> yeah probably Mr. Nice Guy John, John needs a leash yeah they probably wouldn't let him on there. <laughs> they probably wouldn't let him on there it'd be entertaining it'd be entertaining you know I don't know what's going on with my view counts. it's not updating okay let's uh let's see what questions we get here your first question comes from Vesna Polyak with the Australian Financial Review. Oh, well, this is going to be a hard-hitting question here from the Fin Review, guys. Definitely. Please go ahead. Thank you. Hi, what's the governor's position on whether super funds with liquidity issues should be able to participate in the repo facility should they ask for it? Uh, thank you, uh this is an interesting one, particularly with, what is it, 900,000 people looking at getting their super out there? Yes, no. 
the liquidity withdrawal from the super fund industry as a whole is perfectly manageable. For some funds, uh, the withdrawals are going to be quite large though, and those funds will have to shrink. Some of the scenarios uh, suggest that uh, up to 20 or 25 per cent under funds under management could be withdrawn for some particular funds. But these funds have now had uh, a month to get ready and they have uh, further time before those withdrawals will take place. So I am confident that they will be able to meet the liquidity demands uh, from their members. Uh, if the Reserve Bank was to provide uh, a liquidity support facility, it would need to pass the public interest test and we'd need to be able to conclude that it was needed to support the, uh, the stability of the financial system. And at the moment, we're not in a position to conclude that. Thank you. Your next question comes from Peter Ryan with the ABC. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much for taking my question. I was wondering, given everything that you just outlined there, whether you're starting to see any strains um, in uh, confidence in the financial system in terms of what, what we saw back in the GFC when uh, uh, institutions were getting a bit scared to lend to each other. Uh, not at all, Peter. I mean, the, the banks have uh, a lot of liquidity at the moment. During the financial crisis, there were liquidity concerns at certain points in time. The combination of our bond buying program and, liquidity and the term funding facility and, inc and our um, increased repos have given banks the confidence uh, that they um, will have access to the liquidity that's needed. Credit spreads uh, rose a couple of weeks ago, but they are now in the process of normalising, and we've seen some issuers return to both the domestic and the foreign market. So, at the moment, um, we're not seeing signs of any stress at all in our financial system. And I've been incredibly impressed by the commitment of the banks to support their customers through this difficult period. As I said in my prepared remarks, the banks are opting, acting as shock absorbers. To the, to the economy in the uh, in the global financial crisis, not in Australia but elsewhere, the banks were acting as amplifiers. Here, they're acting as shock absorbers, which is to our collective benefit. Thank you. Your ne next question comes from Patrick Commons with the Australian. Please go ahead. Oh, thanks very much, Governor. Uh, my question is whether the RBA's scenario analysis assumes to see damage to the economy from the restriction. restriction. Uh, do they compound at a, at a non-linear rate the longer they are in place? Does, it get, does the damage compound the longer they're in place? Um, it's, it's possible that that's um, the case, although I haven't really thought about that, uh, that scenario in, in a great deal of detail. You'd think you would have, wouldn't you? Can't I'm surprised. But the longer this goes on, then the loss of incomes and the loss of jobs is more pronounced, that's obvious. And uh, the damage to the business sector is more pronounced. And the experience from other recessions is that the more people lose jobs and the more businesses are destroyed, the longer it takes to recover. So um, whether the, how these things compound in practice, um, it's, it's hard to tell, but it's clear that the longer this goes on, the greater the damage to the um, economic infrastructure of the country will be. Wow. Insightful. Thank you. Your next question comes from Jonathan Shapiro with the Australian Financial Review. Please go ahead. Jonathan, your line is live. You might be on mute. Apologies, I've taken that off mute. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Governor. Uh, my question uh, relates to bond markets. Um, what is your level of comfort with regard to long-term bond rates, um, which may be low historically, but are high relative to short-term rates in other major bond markets? Um, and, and is there a risk that the size of government funding tasks creates future dislocation in fixed income markets? Thank you. As you say, long-term bond rates are very low. They're very low in terms of our history. The, I think right at the moment the 10-year yield is at 0.83%. So the Australian government can borrow for 10 years at less than 1% and it can borrow for three years 
at one quarter of one percent. So the borrowing costs are incredibly low. They're as low as they've ever been. I don't have particular concerns that the, government will, that the government's borrowing task will cause dislocation in these markets again. Uh, last week the government raised, I think, $13 billion. This week it's raising another 5 or 6 or $7 billion. So over two weeks it's raised $20 billion. And I expect uh, that we'll return to the markets um, each of the following weeks with um, substantial bond, bond raisings as well. At the moment, I don't have any concerns that uh, that's going to cause dislocation in the market. The, the liaison that we're doing both with the domestic investors and uh, overseas investors is that there's strong demand for Australian government securities, as there should be. We have uh, a very high credit rating. We have one of the lowest stocks of public debt on issue. We're uh, managing the health crisis much better than many other economies, and we will get this get through this in a strong position. So, I don't have any concerns that people want to want to buy um, Australian government bonds. He's got no concerns. Thank you. Your next question comes from Stephen Halmarek with the Commonwealth Bank. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you, and thank you, Phil, for taking the questions. So you talked about reinvigorating growth and productivity. I'm just wondering what you think is on the on the list, what would, should be the priority for the government, uh, governments uh, to reinvigorate productivity? And a quick second question, if I can, what do you, what's your assumptions on the participation rate for the labour market and the impact of that on the unemployment rate? This will be interesting. This will be really interesting to see what happens when... Uh, I mean, here you go, we've got... You got the job keeper. A lot of people are going to be getting more money than they would have received otherwise for doing nothing. Do you think they're all going to participate? Going back in? Thank you. On on the first question, I think the overall challenge is to make Australia a great place where businesses want to expand, innovate, invest, and hire people. Yeah, he's right. But how? There's different approaches to that. Some people are calling for massive government intervention. People are calling for tariffs to protect our industry. But there's going to be a price to pay for everything. How about we do, you know, we look at maybe the government stepping, you know, just, just not completely taking the jack boot off the throat of business, but just, you know, lifting it up a little bit, just a little. And if we can do that, then we'll drive higher living standards for all Australians. Just print and give everyone money. That'll that mean if everyone had a million dollars, everyone would be a millionaire. How do we do that? How do we make Australia a great place to invest, expand, innovate and hire people? Reduce sovereign risk. Make it easier to hire and fire people so small businesses aren't afraid to actually do it. Make the Reduce the red tape that we all have to deal with. Problem is a lot of these people, particularly in Parliament, they've never run a business. Oh, you know, the bureaucrats, they've never run a business, they've never been in the real world. They don't know all the BS you got to deal with. The problem with the CEC, nice guys, um, you know, they'll just, they want to follow the China model too much. <laughs> Higher standards, they want to improve, well, our GDP growth per capita has dropped since the GFC, it's been going down. Wage growth has been going down. They want to try and pull that back up. Well, I think we start off by reading the multitude of uh, reports that have already been commissioned on this issue. and That's it. Reading reports, of course. Of course. One thing, I, I actually did a stint in government. I, well, in a the Architectural Practice Academy underneath, you know, aside from the Department of Public Works. And it was quite interesting just being exposed to that environment, particularly with my uh, political opinions because uh, I, I am as verbal and I share my opinions as much in office as I do here so maybe you can understand why I've you know, evolved into having my own business but uh, what was interesting was just that the, peop the sense of entitlement some people had there and, uh, perhaps I could run through you at a very bit for you oh and the point I was making was all of the these government reports and things that were written with nowhere near as as much academic rigor as I was used to, because I just finished my thesis at university. And that was all what it was about, research methodology methodology and rigor. And none of that existed. 
all these claims are made nothing was backed up by any evidence and even if it was we're learning now in the cash ban it's all just bullshit evidence that they get from a town hall meeting that is more important because it fits their agenda i'm actually doing a video i'm planning to do one in a few days rachel has sent me about banning more single-use plastic and just the way the government here in queensland has put this questionnaire together for their public consultation completely biases it and they've already made the decision it's like with lady salento hospital here they would already made the decision they're just doing the public consultation to tick their box to shut the plebs up to keep us in line because they don't really give a shit about us at a very high level what those uh, reports uh, say they say we should be looking again at the way we tax income generation consumption and land in this country they say we should be looking at how we build and price infrastructure they say we should be looking at how we train our students and our workforce so they've got the skills uh, for, for the modern economy so they want to look at some tax reform that's a good idea education i mean hopefully coming out of this we will see how terrible our education system is here in australia they say we should be looking how at how various regulations promote or perhaps hinder innovation and they say we should be looking at the flexibility and complexity of our industrial relations system <laughs> yeah well I, I just think how much those reports cost and how many people would have given that uh, that advice to our glorious leaders so they're, they're the uh, broad areas. I don't want to advocate uh, particular policies at the moment within each of those areas, but um, there's plenty of advice out there from various other bodies and uh, in these reports that have been commissioned. And I'm hopeful that uh, the spirit of cooperatism, cooperative uh, behaviour that we're now seeing will actually translate into being able to address some of these issues. Yes, comrade, we must all work together for the party. The greater good, the only good thing to come out of uh, the Soviet Union was their national anthem. Seasider asked me a question, mate, which was actually held up. I just saw it. Do you think going to uni is bullshit? Uh, no. Depends on what you do. I think a lot of it, you're jumping through hoops. It's up to you. You can get as much from it or as little from it as you can. I mean, I did architecture. It was two degrees. It took me six and a half years. I worked all the way through. So did Rachel. Um, but, you know probably not the smartest <laughs> smartest profession to do the wage wages are terrible and just the economy is smashed by overseas competition but gives me a lot more flexibility and freedom so i don't regret it but i mean that's here in australia where your university is reasonably cheap i wouldn't be going i wouldn't be doing something stupid something useless arts or anything you know um and it's up to you as an individual to get the best you can from it. I was the first student in my course to do a um, do a do use three D printing uh, in the entire course. I used the medical labs. I took advantage of the workshop. I did extracurricular things. I went on trips overseas that were a complete tax write off because I was studying. Bloody um, that female prime minister ruined that for everyone. So yeah, there are opportunities, mate. Just be smart with what you do. Just be smart. Bob Bob's talking about TAFE gets you a job. Yeah, TAFE is good. It's different to uni, though. TAFE is different to uni. I mean, TAFE's uh, a start. Uni's at usually next level, depending on what you want to do. Often, most people, I'd say, I'd say go to TAFE and then go to uni later if you want to. Because I could have done architecture in or drafting as a drafting and then go to uni afterwards. Um, but it's, it's bloody expensive. You know, do engineering or anything like that. Depends what you want to do, mate. There's lots of people here to give you advice. Or do a trade. Better <laughs> better off buying Bitcoin in 2009. Well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you asked about this. But then, actually, the most important thing for, for university, I met my wife there. <laughs> so that's it. So, yeah, no, I, 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 you know, that's probably the best thing about it. And her advice to, a daughter, you know, to her daughters is when you go to uni, make sure you leave with a husband. <laughs> Assumption on the participation rate, and here again we're working with um, various scenarios because it's very hard to know whether people who have been stood down are going to be actively looking for jobs or they're just going to wait until their business recovers. So at the moment our main focus on the labour market is on total hours worked. 
I think we have a better handle on how total how it, how total hours worked are going to evolve. And as I said, they're expected to be down 20 per cent in, in the June quarter, which is a, a staggering number. And how that then plays out in terms of unemployment and participation and uh, people not being in the labour force, I, I think it's very hard to tell. It really depends upon the success that firms have in keeping their employees attached to them while they're still down. But I think for the next little while, the main fo our main focus will be on total hours worked in the economy. That'll be the best guide to kind of help whether how quickly we're recovering when we see hours work start picking up again. That'll be a figure I'll have to track, everyone. We'll have to keep an eye on total hours work to see how it goes. Bloody hell. Do, do people still think it's going to be a V-shaped recovery? Even if they open up the economy t tomorrow? You know? Thank you. Your next question comes from Shane Wright with The Age. Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, Governor. I'm just wondering... Um, a couple of years ago, the banking regulators and yourselves came to a position around investors and moving them away from, say, investor in interest-only loans and towards uh, principal and interest. Is it now time to reconsider some of those policies, given the real strain that's being placed across the property market on investors who may have lost uh, and on their tenants who may not be able to pay uh, their rent? Well, both the restrictions on investors and on interest-only loans were both removed last year. It's even further back than that. So those, those restrictions are no longer in place. So it's hard. I love how they implement all these restrictions and APRA rules and limitations to, you know, contain the market. Or because it's all bad. Oh, you know, people are going too crazy with their borrowing. We need to we need to restrict. And then oh shit, the economy goes to hell. Uh, we need to. Uh, <laughs> Open everything up again. Get rid of these restrictions. It's all good. But to argue that they're a factor in the current dynamics in the housing market. Uh, I think the property market uh, is likely to go through a difficult period over the f coming months, but it's not because of these restrictions and there's no capacity to remove these restrictions to, to boost the market. Rolf is just bringing up uh, the issue with student debt in America. And uh, I mean, that, that's crazy. A lot of it's, you know, there's cheaper options though. A lot of these stupid people are going and go and taking on huge loans to go, you know, to these expensive universities when it doesn't mean crap. It's like going to bond here, paying extra to go to bond just for the sake of it. And for those of you that don't know, bond is one of the few private universities here in Australia down the Gold Coast. Uh, they've got an architecture degree, bloody expensive one. I don't know why you'd go there. I mean, sure, it's nice and pretty, but yeah, it's. <laughs> I think mine would have cost a what's mine 30 grand not even that would have cost a third but the thing is one thing you'll find with university guys is degree inflation now I went through and I got two bachelor degrees now you have to do a bachelor and a masters and they cost more in the past it used to be an advanced diploma so these degrees are just getting more you know, you're more, more important but they they make no no value compared to experience. It's like a foot in the door, you know. Honestly, if if you're thinking of doing architecture or drafting, get on Linda.com, learn learn Revit, learn drafting, door knock, and try and do work. Get yourself a portfolio, and then get into uni when you have a job. Then you write off the cost of education. Thank you. Your next question comes from Rory Robertson with the Westpac Group Treasury. Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Governor Lowe. Thanks for your thoughtful update on this extraordinary episode. Today's reported 6% fall in employment over the past month is literally off the charts. So on the bright side, the past month has also brought dramatic declines in new COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations to impressively low levels. Despite thousands of resolved COVID-19 cases and serious comparisons with the Spanish flu, so far in Australia, only three people under 60 years of age have died. So my question is, given recent excellent news on the health front and with the National Cabinet flagging a start to a modest, gradual, bit-by-bit -bit easing of restrictions after the Anzac Day weekend, are you increasingly hopeful that a significant economic recovery can begin in coming months? 
Thank you. What do you reckon? Uh, so everyone's getting lots of buffering, guys. Okay, what, I, what I'll do is I will kill the Twitch stream. See you, Twitch guys. Bye, pub. To free up any of my bandwidth, I've dropped it down to 420, and we'll see if that makes a difference. See if my upload is, is factoring into it. So, yeah. Yeah, and no, I'm getting a bit of a bit of a buffer issue here as well, and I'm only bringing I'm only bringing it down at, at 360 to view it. So, what do you think he's going to answer this question, guys? What do you think he's going to answer this question? Australian internet for the win, yeah. Do you think he'll answer it or avoid it? So there you go. See you, Twitchies. Well, I listened to the Prime Minister's uh, press conference before um, coming down here this afternoon, and he did say that we're now on the road back and we've reached a turning point. He followed that up by saying that the current restrictions need to stay in place for some time because we don't want to have a major setback here. There's been an unbelievably huge effort by Australians to get us to this um, very good position we're in now. And I'm hopeful that if we can continue that effort, then the restrictions will be able to be eased in time and that within three or four months we'll start the recovery. But uh, for us to recover, we do need to keep the virus under control and we have to rely on the health experts there. Uh, but the next, as I said in my remarks, the next few months are going to be very difficult. And today's data from the ABS saying that there was a 6% decline in the number of jobs in the country in the past three weeks. It just reminds us just how significant uh, the contraction is. So I hope, uh, hope the effort that we've all put in to reduce the uh, incidence of the virus continues and that we can start recovering in a few months' time. I didn't turn off the router. It's all, this is actually hardwired. The stream's dead. Okay. No, I don't know if it's... I'll do a uh, speed test. I seem to be getting a good up. I'm getting 45 down, 45 megabits per second down. We'll see the upload speed. You know what? It could be. It could be. Yeah, I'm only getting 1.6 up. Hang on. Hang on. Got my sister-in-law living here now, that's what it is. She could be using up my bandwidth. <laughs> oh, we'll keep going, we'll keep going. Keep going. Thank you. Your next question comes from Philip Lasca with the ABC. Please go ahead. Oh, so Pub's telling me he's getting it fine. So, you know, it must, must be all of us, us plebs who can't afford his super good internet in Sydney. Uh, Governor, um, you said uh, not so long ago, uh, just a moment ago, that the more businesses that are destroyed, the longer it takes for the recovery, for the ec economic recovery. Um, is it wise under those circumstances then to rule out any type of assistance to prevent companies from collapsing? Um, is it wise, for example, for governments to rule out providing low interest loans to companies or investing or providing equity to those companies, particularly if those companies are in strategically important sectors or in labour intensive sectors. Uh, but after all, we're, we're going to see structural damage to the jobs market as well as a result of this. And also, why uh, are you reluctant to use the word recession? Uh, I'm not reluctant to use it, but I, don't, I think this is kind of better described as a, an economic contraction. You, know, you can use the word recession if you want, but I'm thinking this is a kind of a, a very marked economic contraction. It's very different to the business cycle downturns that we've seen over the past 50 or 60 years. It's a once-in-a-century event. 
the market economic contraction from which we'll recover from. And okay, so everyone's. I'm going to. I'm going to kill the stream for a second, guys, and reinstigate it at a lower setting. Okay, one sec. Okay, I've just restarted the stream. How's that going, guys? I've just dropped down to 720. So you can't see me in all my 1080 goodness. Maybe I just have to do that with the streams at the moment. It's all good. Yeah, I've got it coming up here, 42 people. All good, guys. Okay, let's keep going. For me, it's it's the issue. The label isn't particularly important, but uh, uh, but it is a once in a century economic contraction. Uh, you asked about kind of the government providing assistance uh, and how, how is that appropriate? And the government has already provided huge amounts of assistance to businesses to keep them afloat. In the first couple of uh, policy packages, there were large payments to small businesses, cash payments to keep them afloat. The government has delayed or deferred many charges on businesses as well. And the wage subsidy program is really helping many businesses keep afloat and to keep the workers connected to the business, which is incredibly important as well. So the government has done an extraordinary uh, amount so far we can always debate whether it should take further steps, but I think it's appropriate at the moment to pause and to, to examine um, the evidence on the success of the program so far. Thank you. Your next question comes from John Kehoe with Australian Financial Review. Please go ahead. Hi, Governor, thank you for the speech and making yourself available for questions. Um, you mentioned that headline inflation could very well turn negative um, this year. Uh, there are some creditable economists out there who are worried about deflation uh, more over the medium term, um, pointing to some sort of negative spiral between wages and inflation and the hours work, some of those trends you're talking to. Um, doesn't that mean that invariably or inevitably we're going to need pretty serious ongoing fiscal and monetary support for quite a while, even beyond the initial emergency, just to counteract the, uh, the threat or risk of deflation, which could be very damaging over the medium term. Well, I don't think we're going to have deflation over the medium term. In the next uh, quarter, we've got some very specific and unusual events which are going to drive the inflation rate low into negative territory, probably, and that's the big decline in oil prices and the introduction of free childcare immediately. So there, free childcare. There, are uh, events that are unlikely to be repeated. I think uh, at some point oil prices will um, probably rise again, and uh, uh, the government won't keep on um, cutting childcare prices. So I think inflation will, after a period, normalise. But I also think that we're going to have to have low interest rates for a very long period of time. Uh, as I've said uh, on previous occasions, we will not be increasing the cash rate until we're confident that inflation is going to be between 2 and 3 per cent on a sustainable basis. Uh, when we release our forecasts in a couple of weeks, you'll see that inflation over, our, over the horizon is not going to be between 2 and 3 per cent over the next two or three years. So, I think it's quite likely that we have the current setting of interest rate for a number of years. Uh, and this is reinforced by our target on three yields of 25 basis points. It's quite likely that we'll be at this level of interest rate for years. And low level of interest rates and fiscal support I think will be enough to get the economy growing at a reasonable pace and over time wage growth to gradually pick up. 
wage growth previously was uh, not fast enough to deliver 2.5% inflation. And as I said in my prepared remarks, wage growth is going to slow. And I think it'll be a couple of years before it's back to the current rate. So we're going to have low inflation and low interest rates for quite a long period of time. That's the world we... At least you're all enjoying the lag, guys. <laughs> I'm still here. Yeah, okay. Something's going on. Yeah, I'm getting a low connection. Oh, uh, well, I think with that, guys, we'll, uh, I think the stream's just going to die. What's going on? Yeah. If mine isn't working, what's going on here? Oh, we'll keep going. Oh, it's working. Thank you. Your next question comes from Michael Pasco with The New Daily. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Governor. The gap between the emergency funding now in place six month time limit on it from the government and the eventual impact of the worthy productivity initiatives you mentioned there is a big gap between those two events the bridge would seem to be considerably longer than six months do you envisage further funding will be needed in order to prevent the real unemployment rate going significantly above six percent well, it, it really depends upon um, how, how long the restrictions remain in place. But I was encouraged by um, the press conference of the Prime Minister and uh, the Chief Medical Officer and the Health Minister. They were saying that we now, they think we're on the road back. And if we stay on that road, then these restrictions will be progressively lifted. And as that happens, economic activity will return towards normal. We can, we, I think we all hope that that uh, takes place as quickly as possible. Uh, hoping could mean the court's short when it doesn't. It is part, I mean, it's there. Wow, a sensible question there. <laughs> a sensible question. So it looks like the stream is working, but I'm getting different feedback from different things so i'm just going to keep going until we finish this very least i can put up the recording recorded version there are various scenarios here and um in our statement of monetary policy to be released in a few weeks time we'll outline some of those scenarios uh, none of us have a um, crystal ball here so it is possible that the virus reappears and uh, we can't loosen off the restrictions in that scenario the the loss of jobs and incomes is even more staggering than, than I outlined in the central scenario. So, but the, 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 we shouldn't um, catastrophize here. The current signs are positive uh, on the health front, and if they can continue, then they'll turn positive on the economic front as well. Thank you. Your next question comes from Prashant Nunaha with TD Securities. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, a question on the bond buying conducted by the RBA so far. Um, why has the RBA not purchased uh, duration uh, beyond the 10-year segment of the curve? Um, does the bank believe that the segment of that curve is functioning smoothly, or uh, are there other issues at play? Uh, well, our, 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 we've had two main focuses. One is to get the three-year yield at 25 basis points. To do that, we've uh, bought a lot of securities at the short end, as you would expect. And the second objective was to um, improve market functioning. And the area of the curve that we'd focused uh, most on was between three and ten years. And as we've uh, improved, as we've purchased those securities, the market is working more effectively. And we also hear from our liaison that as we've improved the functioning of that part of the market, the market has also improved for the longer term securities, the ones between 10 and 30 years. 
So I'm hopeful that this is gradual process of normalisation taking place and that starting at the um, securities less than 10 years has facilitated that process. We don't have any um, in principle objection to buying along the securities but we focused our purchases where we thought they'd be most effective and that was around the three year mark and out to 10 years. Thank you. Your next question comes from Matthew Cranston with the Financial Review. Please go ahead. Uh, Dr Lowe, I'm just wondering uh, if you can give um, some views on the traditional transmission channels of uh, your monetary policy and how that's going to work. Um, I noticed you've said uh, that three billion out of the 90 billion in that facility has gone through to 35 institutions. But uh, how deeply does that go into the economy? How many people will take up cheap loans, uh, and uh, and how valuable and and how worthwhile are cheaper loans? And do they get through in all those? traditional mechanisms well I said good point who's going to take them who's going to take on these cheap loans that uh, 35 institutions have so far drawn funding under the term funding facilities but I'm expecting that over the coming months that every single financial institution will draw funding under that scheme uh, initially uh, not everyone has because they haven't uh, got their liquidity plans um, uh, to the state where they're in a position to draw on, on the funding, but I'm confident that they will, and we've um, spoken to uh, most of Australia's financial institutions, and they say they're going to draw under the scheme. And I'm confident that with institutions being able to raise funds at 25 basis points, that will, in time, be passed through to um, lower cost of funding for their mortgage customers and their business customers. We saw that immediately after we made the announcement of this policy package, a number of the banks cut their interest rates by 100 basis points to small and medium-sized businesses. So there was an immediate transmission, and partly that was on the back of our, our um, announcement. So I think it's, it's working. And the other way that it's working is giving institutions the confidence that they will have access to liquidity. In, a, uh, in difficult financial times, institutions might worry that they can't get funding and therefore they don't want to lend. Uh, we've taken that risk off the table for Australian financial institutions. They will have access to funding, we'll make sure of that, and the cost of that funding will be low. Uh, through the process of competition, I think that eventually leads to um, lower funding costs and credit being available to businesses and help. I'm having problems with the uh, stream rate, Mr Nice Guy. Uh, don't know what's happening. <laughs> I think I may need to stop doing these at 180. Maybe do a custom upload a lot lower. I think it's just because everyone is using the internet at night. Households. And the other point that I would make here is that I've been incredibly impressed by the commitment of the banks to do the right thing by their customers. Uh, they understand that they're part of Team Australia, that they... This is what is it? This has got nothing to do with part of Team Australia. This has got everything to do with them protecting their assets. The banks wouldn't give a shit about people. They need to protect their assets. If property falls out the arse because they start, they start uh, foreclosing on everyone, their assets are going to take the hit. Oh, am I the only one that thinks like that? They have a role to play in um, keeping the economy running. So that commitment to being on Team Australia plus the competitive dynamics that come from having guaranteed access to funding at lower interest rates, we'll see um, lower funding costs and more credit available to both businesses and households, which in time will help. The lower exchange rate also has an effect on the currency, which in time, again, uh, will help. Thank you. Your next question comes from Will Caloris with CNBC. Please go ahead. Thanks, Governor. I was just wondering, in terms of, you know, you mentioned the banks being the shock absorbers for the economy, that the main transmission method in terms of a lot of the funding support, would it be your preference for them to forego paying dividends, much like we're seeing in New Zealand, until we see some kind of clarity as to the economic impact moving forward? Uh, well, they've... Um, they're certainly going to cut back dividends, which I think is entirely appropriate. Uh, APRA made an announcement on this issue last week or the week before last. I think that was appropriate that financial institutions 
cut back dividends. Got to remember that Australia's banks. I agree with you there. It really feels like it, doesn't it? Only hoping for the best. At very high levels of capital. We've uh, undertaken extensive stress, stress testing. In all those stress tests, they maintain well capitalised. So uh, they have the ability to pay dividends, and some Australians rely on those dividends for uh, their income. So there's a balance to be struck, and by cutting back dividends from where they were over the past couple of years, I think we're moving in the right direction to strike that right balance. But I don't think they need to be banned. Thank you. Your next question comes from Sarah Turner with the AFR. Please go ahead. Oh, hello, thanks for taking my question. Um, I'm just wondering how you see the Australian dollar's role um, as a shock absorber this time around. Um, do you think it's going to be as effective as it has been in the past, um, given that um, the forecast for global demand is pretty weak at the moment? Well, as you... Um say the exchange rate has been um, a shock absorber in the past and my view looking at the economic history for the past 30 years is the exchange rate is has been the great shock absorber it's stabilized the economy more than um, any anything else perhaps even more than our own monetary policy uh, the exchange rate at the moment is working as it normally would um, earlier in the year it was in the high 60s it came down um, more than we expected uh, a month ago as uh, investors were engaged in blind selling of assets to generate cash. But as that period of panic has passed, the exchange rate's come up a bit, but it's still down very significantly on the year. And that's helping stabilise the economy. At the moment, there may be not very much imports and exports taking place, but once the restrictions start uh, lifting the lower currency that we have, will help our exporters and domestic industries. So it's working as normal. But a, a few weeks ago, there was kind of um, a very large depreciation as people panicked, but that panic has now passed. Thank you, Judy. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us on this conference call. So there you have it, guys. That was... When I spoke a few weeks ago... That was the... The economic and financial update from our Reserve Bank Governor. What does everyone think? Are you surprised with the outcome? You know, I, I th it really seems quite hopeful what he's predicting. Not really any worst case scenarios, guys. <laughs> what do you reckon? It's definitely going to be interesting to see what happens. I mean, nothing too exciting there. Seems quite hopeful. Seems quite hopeful. Anyway, guys, thank you all for watching me and joining me with this episode. I'll try and figure out what's going on with the upload. Maybe maybe it's just to do with the time of day I'm doing it and the demand. Or I may have to change some settings. I'm only getting 848 KBS up, so not very good. Anyway, guys, thanks for watching, and I will see you all later. Take care. Yeah, oh, I will, sugar, but it's, uh, I'm tired, it's tiring, <laughs> it's tiring, you know. Bob's asking, hang on, I'm getting some of your questions in now. Um, Heiser, oh, that's a serious question, what do you think? He's an idiot, RBA's been wrong for 20 years, I think Libs have shifted after the RBA, and Libs are corrupt. I think there's very little difference between the two, just look at... Look at um, Shorten's comments to the American ambassador. Uh, look at that. You know. But we'll see. I'll try and get a few more streams. We'll see. We'll see if I get some more. It just comes down to getting the stream up and running is a little bit more work. And I like to just jump on and do a real quick recording and discuss different things. Particularly with this issue with the bloody bloody bandwidth. I'm thinking maybe it's my network connections around the house. You know. I got this cable. Maybe a rat's chewed through the wire. That's what that's what happens with the Queensland. I run the cable under the house. 
and it chews through the cat five sometimes i gotta i learned how to manually rewire a cable together because i mean i gotta save money guys gotta learn these skills you know yeah i know i'm just annoyed with the um with the buffering that's the problem i'll get it i'll figure it out anyway guys take care it's 9 20 i might might do a bit of work today or play some computer games tonight we'll see take care everyone I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.